Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fox 2's Rup Raj. It is so good to be with you today. We have a wonderful program for you. You know, everything we're doing now is virtual, including this. And I know I'm joined by Sandy and Dory right now. We're going to get to all, all of the great participants uh, on this in just a moment. But I wanted to personally say thank you for taking the time to be with us today, because on this great day, we're reminded of the bright spots in our community. And one of those bright spots is Gift of Life. I had the chance to MC an event for Gift of Life not long ago. And I learned uh, quickly before the pandemic how critically important it was uh, that people do this kind of work and they make sure that uh, we listen to this inspiring dialogue we're about to hear and act on it by understanding the importance of organ donation, but also taking the right actions. You know, Gift of Life Michigan's Facebook page and YouTube page is broadcasting this right now. Uh, we please ask that you share on all of your social networks the fact that you're on this call right now, maybe we'll to come join us as well. Today's business roundtable is part of Let's Talk, Gift of Life's multicultural outreach program to educate African-American, Latinx, and Arab-American communities about the real need in our community for organ donors and break down misconceptions, because there are so many misconceptions, and yes, that's why they call them misconceptions. They're just not true. So many things that you may be wondering about, you'll have answers to those questions in this program. Since its inception in 2019, the campaign continues to encourage conversation about these issues and bring diverse donor stories to the forefront. I know that when I had a chance to sit down and talk to some folks who actually needed the gift of life, you hear their stories and you truly understand that this is a life and death nature for so many people out there. And for others, it's a quality of life issue. And if it were not for those wonderful people who are making sure they act on this and donate, uh, many people would go without. And that means a lifestyle that just is tough to live. And people are doing it with great courage and uh, with great finesse, but we should encourage people to make sure that we help them all. This pandemic has really been a challenge. You know, I talked with Dory just uh, about an hour ago, we're doing a piece on Fox 2 News on the day that we're doing this program. And I said, what has the pandemic done to organ donors and to the to, to, to the entire program? And she said, like everything in life, it's put a damper and it's put a um, kind of a pause button on so many people's lives. We wanna take that remote control and try to unpause the parts that we can to allow the flow to start uh, start happening again with organ donations. Uh, so to continue down our path forward together, and that's an important word in this, together, uh, we will be addressing health disparities and provide resources to make sure that everybody who's watching and those who aren't in our communities are healthy. Now let's welcome Doris Dill, CEO of Gift of Life in Michigan. And Doris, uh, I feel like we just were continuing our call from our Fox 2 interview about an hour ago, but we know how critically important this is. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Now, we understand that the COVID-19 pandemic has once again highlighted the health disparities experienced by multicultural communities, and it's forced us really to rethink how we do things. Talk about that for a moment. Well, as is uh, true in many areas of healthcare, uh, minorities have conditions or health conditions that are more likely to make them vulnerable for the need for organ transplant. And unfortunately, we've learned with COVID-19 that it also makes them more likely to be vulnerable to uh, a virus like COVID-19. And actually, the, the CDC has reported that um, minorities are twice as likely to get the virus and more likely to die from the virus than um, than others. And so it's it, and that's true. It, it uh, parlays exactly uh, in the same way to organ donation and the need for transplantation. That's so important. And we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, introduce uh, Sandy Burrow with the Detroit Regional Chamber, who's literally on the call with us right now. He's in the triple box as we're all talking. So, Sandy, I do want to say a very warm welcome to you as well. I know we're going to be talking to you in a minute, but if you'd like to say a few words before we continue our conversation with Doris. Uh, no, Roop. Uh, first of all, I just want to you know thank you for your time and your commitment. Uh, you do so much for the community, and this is yet one of the other things that you do. And I obviously want to thank uh, the, the folks at Gift of Life uh, for really the life changing and life saving work that they do. And uh, I'm happy to join whenever uh, when, whenever you tell me you need me in the conversation. We're going to get to you in a moment for sure, but I wanted to make sure that everyone saw uh, your very recognizable mug that everyone's familiar with, with the great work you do in the community. And uh, Doris, we, we focus back and pivot back to Gift of Life for a second, specifically talking uh, about what Gift of Life has done to remain a resources to businesses and the donor community. Talk about that for a moment, if you would. 
Well, certainly our work happens out in the community, um, whether it's out in the community raising awareness about the need for organ and tissue donation, encouraging individuals to sign up in the donor registry, but also organ and tissue donation starts in a hospital, in a donor hospital in Michigan. So really, there's, there's really no aspect of our organization that was not dramatically hit mid-March when COVID came. And in very short order, uh, we had to rethink how we do everything, including how we respond to um, individuals who are dying in a hospital and who wanted to be organ and tissue donors, as well as the way we educate the public about the continuing need. And I'm incredibly proud of my team because they did not skip a beat. They uh, they really became extremely resourceful and figured out how to talk to families whose loved one was dying, how to continue the conversation about the desperate need for organ and tissue donors, and to continue to get people to sign up in the donor registry. You take a look at uh, COVID-19 and uh, the effect that it's had on minority communities, uh, the comorbidity issues, of course, that we've heard about uh, in those minority communities. Talk for a moment about organ donation and the critical nature of why it's important that we we sit back and we, we concentrate on that population as well. Some statistics that may be surprising to some people, huh, Doris? Yes, yeah, so, you know, uh, right now there's over 120,000 people waiting for um, organ transplants in the United States, and the vast majority of those okay. are kidney recipients. Okay, yeah. And kidney, um, kidney patients are far more likely to be uh, persons of color, and um, and they suffer more likely from diseases like diabetes or hypertension that um, might cause their kidneys to fail. And so we, um, it's it's not uncommon to see those groups in in large uh, numbers on the transplant list. Well, Dory, we want to say thank you for all the great work that you do in our community. Is there anything anything else that you'd like people to really walk away with from today's event? What's something that people can do right away? You know, one of the things about COVID-19, um, I think that's really been um, a silver lining is that people continue to want to help others. And they and many of them have continued to do that through organ and tissue donation. And so um, our biggest message is to sign up in the donor registry. And you can do that either at the Secretary of State's office or you can do that through our website but commit to becoming an organ and tissue donor yourself. Talk to your family about that um, because should something happen to you, saving the life of someone else is a remarkable a mar remarkable event. Remind people about the website if they wanna learn more, make a donation, uh, or perhaps just uh, see if they're qualified to be an organ donor themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we tell everybody you're qualified. Don't re rule yourself out with any health conditions, but they can go to our website at giftoflifemichigan.org. And uh, there's a link there where they can can register into the Secretary of State's office. I know that the uh, at the close of this event, the goal is to make sure that everyone will join the Gift of Life Michigan as we enhance the quality of life for multicultural communities uh, by increasing the number of organ donor and tissue donors in the state of Michigan. So Dory, thank you for doing uh, your large part in that. And we thank you for your time, of course, in leading this organization. My pleasure. All right, let's uh, move along the program now. And from that, we'd like to welcome our special guest speaker, Detroit Regional Chamber President and CEO, Sandy Bura. Uh, Bura. And it's good to see you. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Sandy, first of all, you, you, know, you do so much in the community. Um, when did you first know, uh, in a, on a personal level, the importance of organ donorship? Well, I grew up in a medical family group and, uh, you know, organ donation was just something that was, you know, considered very natural and, and, and very expected. So I have been an organ donor uh, and our entire family has since, you know, you know, since somewhere when the time that the dinosaurs, you know, roamed the earth. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, 2015 that I realized that I needed one uh, myself, and that kind of you know, uh, it kind of came full circle, if you could, you could say. So, what is that? Take us through that process. I mean, you know, growing up in a family where you understood probably more than uh, someone who wasn't in a medical family the importance of it, but it really hit home for you in 2015. Uh, without getting too personal about every uh, you know detail, uh, what you can share with us, talk about what that was like. 
Yeah, no, my, my story is pretty public. I, I kept it private while I was going through it and up until the, uh, the, the transplant. Uh, you know, if I was in my old role, uh, you know, as a, as a public official, I, I would have gone public with it. But since I'm kind of in this semi-public, semi-private uh, role now, I, I, I went to my board and asked for permission if I could basically kind of keep it quiet. And, and they said yes. But now that it's, you know, now that it's done, I'm happy to talk about the, the details. Uh, and there's actually a little bit of a timeliness here, too, because uh, this all started with me uh, getting the flu uh, in early uh, 2015. And I got the flu. I had the flu really bad, even though I, you know, as always got a flu shot. But, you know, the flu shot is, you know, about 70 percent effective on the average year. And I fell in, you know, that 30 percent that particular year where the flu shot did not uh, do the trick uh, for me. So I was down and out for two weeks, you know, really, really out and uh, kind of rallied for a few days. I had an important political event that I kind of rallied for. Then my wife and I were on vacation and I knew something was wrong. Uh, and we were away for two weeks and uh, I, I, you know, without uh, trying to make it sound like a first world problem, I was the only guy walking around uh, Hawaii in a sweater uh, because I was so cold, uh, you know, not to get too graphic, but I was awfully constipated. I had zero energy. Uh, it was just, I knew something was wrong. And so I came back and, you know, went to the doctor. And by the time I got to the doctor shortly after our trip, uh, you know, I essentially, it was down to something like, you know, 12% or 15% of kidney function. So it happened that quickly. Wow. And so uh, right before this time, it, were, there, were there any misconceptions or things? Because obviously following that, uh, the treatment and the diagnosis, and then obviously the the kidney transplant. Um, there was were there misconceptions as you were about to go under the knife, so to speak, about what organ donorship was all about. Um, well, uh, that's a great question, Roop, and I, I, I want to see if I can answer it semi smartly. So, uh, in terms of the process, uh, the one thing that really struck me is uh, the the relative ease of recovery. Uh, and I, I, when people ask me, you know, what was the most surprising thing about getting a new, a new organ was that I, I recovered so quickly. Now, fortunately, uh, other than, you know, my kidneys uh, essentially ceasing to be useless or useful, uh, I'm in, rel I'm, I'm in com comparatively good health. Uh, but my recovery was 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 incredibly easy. Um, but I will tell a, 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 a kind of quick story. So uh, when you get the call, it's kind of a last minute call in, in most cases. And so we're driving to the hospital. My wife's driving. I'm on the phone because it was a Friday. We had travel plans that weekend. You know, I'm so I'm calling airlines and hotels. And and actually, I had I had Hamilton tickets that I needed to give away that were paper. And I'm like calling friends at oh dark thirty in the morning, waking them up. Say, listen, if you can get to New York <laughs> for yeah. tomorrow night, I got Hamilton tickets, so I gave those away. So I was so preoccupied with kind of administrative stuff that, you know, by the time I got to the pre op room, you know, where they're kind of gowning you up and, you know, uh, hooking you up with tubes, I, I had to, I kind of said to the nurses, hey, time out. And um, I said, I've never understood the term scared S-less until right this moment. And I really need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the nurses laughed, and you know, uh, and I went to the bathroom and I did my business. I came back and I got my transplant. It was, uh, it, it was kind wow. of a unique moment. So, wait, you know, a unique moment, but a moment in many ways that you could say changed your life because when you gowned up and 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 you laid down and you said, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm at the mercy of the doctors here. You, you, you know, obviously probably prayed and and hoped that you would be fine at the end of this. When you got up and you woke up and you knew that you had a transplant, from that moment on, your life changed, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, there there are so many people who are uh, have kidney disease like like I did that didn't have it nearly as easy. Uh, as I did, you know, one, you know, because of some health factors. And, and obviously, I had a tremendous amount of support, not everyone has uh, that level of support, either at home or in the workplace. Uh, and, you know, I was obviously just incredibly grateful. My, my first uh, thought was of, of the donor family. 
uh, because you know my good fortune, my family's good fortune, uh, was the result of someone losing a loved one, and uh, the family that lost the loved one uh, lost uh, someone who was uh, roughly my age, so you know, kind of early fifties, and uh, you know that's obviously far too early to to lose someone. So that was that was my first thought. Uh, my second thought was uh, not to be repetitive, Rup, but I I actually felt uh, surprisingly good. Uh, listen, I wasn't ready to run a marathon or, uh, you know, walk up and down stairs, but, uh, you know, I was expecting excruciating pain. I was expecting, uh, the need for, you know, uh, yelling out for morphine. Uh, I literally took, uh, you know, two prescription, uh, pain tablets, uh, one in the hospital, one after I got home, uh, and the rest of it was just over the counter extra thing Tylenol. It, it, it blew me away. And that really is a testament to the advancements that have been made in medical science and medical practice uh, over the decades. I, I don't think this would have been the case uh, even 10 years ago. You know, you're such a, a, a big name in this, in this area and really across the country based on all the things that you've done in your career, uh, working for presidents and working in, you know, the White House and and, and all of these things, the people that you know, this network is huge of yours, not just in Detroit, but across the country. Um, do you find it kind of like a responsibility of sorts uh, to talk about this because so many people don't? Yeah, you no, know, absolutely. Uh, I, I do. In fact, I reached out to Gift of Life because you know what I really wanted to promote was uh, what was was, uh, was organ donation. Uh, you know, not just kidney uh, donation, but just you know organ donation in general. Uh, because again, since I was an organ donor uh, since you know my very first driver's license, you know back in the Stone Age, uh, you know never thought I'd need one myself. But now I'm really committed to the idea of you know everyone. Uh, who who is able, which is most of the population, uh, to be to be an or organ donor, and you know, talk about the network. Uh, you know, I was uh, I, I actually got contacted by President Bush, my former boss, uh, after the transplant. Uh, my story, uh, which I wrote up, uh, appeared in Cranes. It appeared in uh, in the Bush Network uh, newsletters. Uh, so it is, you know, we're. We've done a lot, uh, or I've tried to do as much as, as I can, and that's why I, you know, reached out to Gift of Life and said, "Listen, you know, I, I've, I've got a little mini platform here. I'm happy to use it uh, to help advance the cause of, of organ donation in Michigan." I got to tell you, it is so helpful to hear that uh, because, you know, what I always tell people when you're in a position of of power, you know, obviously there's great responsibility, but there's also uh, the, the the generosity that you have to have. It's incumbent to have to understand the position that you're in, and then to share and help where you can. And that's exactly, you've done that in many circles, but in this circle, specifically today, I want to say thank you to you uh, for doing so, because by using your influence, by using your name, by using all that, it, it really does move the meter for a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't be listening. And so Sandy Barua, first off, I can speak on behalf of all of us here in Detroit. We're just so grateful you're healthy and well, uh, because you're such a, a contributing member to our community. But really, uh, from a personal level, we're happy that you're healthy as well. Thanks for joining us today. Great. Thank great. you so much. We appreciate all the folks in Gift of Life. Yeah, the great, great people here. You know, and one of those great people is uh, Gary Roth. Uh, and we want to welcome to our panel now uh, is Gary Roth, the Chief Medical Officer, Michigan Health and Hospital Association and Gift of Life Advisory Board member, uh, and Dory with the Gift of Life Michigan. So um, we want to kind of keep keep the conversation flowing here with all of us that are that are on this uh, call, but I do want to mention that uh, in about eight minutes or so, I'll have to take off. So Melissa, Mel Melissa Thrasher, a friend of mine uh, with Gift of Life, is going to be taking over the conversation. So we're doing this organically, and everyone, as you know, including yourself at home right now, working uh, to to balance work and also do some of this stuff, which is uh, a labor of love for me to be here today. Uh, so Gary, thank you for joining us today. I want I wanted to first begin by asking you if you could just tell us about the role of Michigan Health. Uh, and hospital association with COVID-19 impacting communities of color at the greatest rate. Why is education so important when it comes to this conversation? Well, thank you. Let me do a quick mic check. Uh, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yes. I, I can hear you. It's a little bit low, but I'm sure they'll work to boost that up. Uh, if they can turn it up maybe uh, a couple notches, that'd be awesome, Gary. And as you do that, let's go right to, uh, to, to Dory just for a moment. I wanted to ask Dory, how did you and and Sandy Connect, by the way. 
Actually, Sandy had started working with some of my staff um, in the Detroit area, and he'd come forward again, offering to use um, his story and his platform to help us educate the public. And he and I were actually scheduled to meet, um, I think the day before we ended up closing down our offices. So I actually, uh, when I saw him today on the video, it's the first time I physically have seen him. Uh, we've had some conversations, but um, you know, it, it just emphasizes the point though, that those personal stories are really what drive the message, you know, that um, his experience and, uh, and how it came to be that he needed a kidney transplant, it's really important for the public to see um, you know, what impact they can make in someone's life. And as a result, he's certainly paying it forward and sharing his story as, as much as he can um, to show people that kidney transplant and kidney donation is not something to be afraid of. And, um, and we really appreciate his involvement with our organization. For um, I think uh, he feels very grateful for the great, wonderful work that you're doing. And Gary, that includes you. Uh, so we go back to you for a moment to talk about the role of the Michigan Health and hospital association um, with with the minority impact so large. Um, talk about the process of really informing people about this and getting people involved. All right, well, thank you. Once again, let me do the quick mic check. Are we good? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. It is it is quite faded, but uh, I can definitely mm -hmm. hear you, Gary. Gary, okay. have you tried have you tried not using the headsets and just talking through your computer laptop? That often does the trick. Yeah, actually, I turned up. I can get. We're, we're, we're good there. I turned off the microphone on the headset. Um, so the, the Michigan Health and Hospital Association uh, uh, is a statewide leader, we, and we're rep representing all the community and acute care hospitals in Michigan. Um, we, uh, we have a mission statement. We say we advance the health of individuals and communities. And uh, by doing that, MHA represents the interest of, of the hospitals. Uh, we represent them. Uh, in a legislative, in the regulatory arenas, and we also uh, uh, represent and assist hospitals and health systems in, from a quality and patient stand, uh, safety standpoint. Now, with COVID-19, uh, the MHA had to go to the next level, and that was assisting hospitals and health systems, securing testing supplies, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, and then state and federal relief funding. And uh, uh, additionally, we went to, again, a next step, and that we started to convene medical leadership from throughout the state. And uh, that allowed us to help to share resources, share information, uh, sharing facts and knowledge. So you asked specifically about uh, uh, what, I, what we label the social determinants of, of, of health and how that has created health disparities for community for communities of color, by example. So there are issues relative to transportation, uh, fresh and healthy food options, most certainly income and social status and, 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 and education. Uh, they, those uh, those of, of color also uh, may have a, a higher predisposition, or I should say, um, uh, associated uh, um, issues such as hypertension, diabetes. And then, of course, those in particular can, can lead towards uh, uh, kid, kidney failure, kidney uh, uh, insufficiency. So one of the areas that we've really embarked on was to increase education, to improve uh, um, uh, access to, to uh, uh, knowledge base, and uh, uh, to, to help to be a source for employers throughout, throughout the state. And then most certainly in, in Southeast Michigan, where we saw the, the earliest and most severe uh, uh, impact by COVID-19. Well, such an important conversation uh, that you continue uh, with us. And I wanted to just say to Dory, uh, if you wouldn't mind, we're gonna pull Melissa Thrasher into the mix now so that you can continue this discussion uh, with both Gary and Dory. And so Dory, we thank you for, uh, for having me today and Gary as well. Melissa, we'll have you pop on now and we'll have you continue the conversation with Gary. And here she comes, ladies and gentlemen, Melissa Thrasher. And Dory, I want to apologize. I said, I, I was saying your name and I was reading it off of my 
my iPad and I said, Doris, not Billy, my apologies for that. And I'd like to welcome Melissa into the mix and thank you very much for having me. Gary, thank you for the wonderful work you do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And Ruth, thank you for your leadership. Appreciate you. Pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So hi, Dory and Gary. I'm taking over this second round of our dynamic business roundtable. So Gary, thanks for your wonderful response. To follow up with that, can you share how employees on dialysis were impacted by COVID-19? Well, thank you. And what I'm going to do is want to comment on how patients were affected by, by uh, COVID-19 as it relates to the dialysis. There's over 500,000 dialysis patients in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a group of patients, of individuals, those within our population that they cannot put off the deferred care. They must get their dialysis. It could be three or four times a week for certain types of dialysis. Others, it might actually be daily. So dialysis centers had their challenges. Uh, they needed to keep their patients safe. They needed to keep their staff, their staff safe. Their staff needed to be able to work. They needed to be available to care for their, the patients that needed them. So by the nature of dialysis centers in particular, and by the nature of dialysis patients, dialysis patients, again, being more susceptible to COVID, uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're frequently diabetic. They frequently have high blood pressure. They frequently have vascular disease, possibly reduced mobility. And those are just to mention a few. So dialysis centers in particular, they, they, they needed to do, in addition to what they've always done very well, and, and I say that because dialysis centers, just by the nature of what they do, they've already very attentive to details. They're very attentive to, the, uh, uh, to reducing the likelihood of infection, reducing the likelihood of spread of disease. So with their patient population, uh, relative to COVID, they needed to be very, they need to be on very high alert relative to symptoms that, that patients may exhibit that may be suggestive of, of COVID. They needed, they would be doing temperature checks. They would be using uh, appropriate uh, 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 personal protective equipment. And dialysis centers were also dealing with some of the same shortages that other healthcare centers were dealing with. So what did they do? How did, how did this affect the patient? So many centers had to identify their patients that were at highest risk and how to, uh, how to assist them. One of the terms we use is cohorting. So certain centers would uh, uh, be available to, uh, uh, to patients that, were, um, that were, uh, had COVID or those that may be suspected of having COVID. So in a way they would separate those patients, whether it was by the actual center, separate them by the shift, the time of the day that uh, they would be seen in the centers, and uh, sometimes it may just be specifically within certain areas of, of a dialysis center, specific rooms, specific wing within the center. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, this could create just some minor inconveniences to dialysis patients. In particular, uh, they may need to, as I said, change the time of day that they would receive their dialysis or the day of the week. But sometimes it was a major inconvenience because many of our many patients may not have easy access to transportation. So if they had to uh, go to a center that uh, um, was not their usual center and they needed a different form of transportation, and those were that was another area where the dialysis centers assisted. So it was a long way around saying that patients were impacted often by the convenience factor, uh, which most certainly can be significant. But in the centers that I had the opportunity to have conversations with, they were up and running. They were providing the care to their patients and patients were able to receive the dialysis as they needed it. Excellent, excellent. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about how this pandemic has touched people of color. Um, my question to the both of you is, how can business leaders address health disparities to improve the quality of life for communities of color? So what leaders, what can leaders do? Um, I think primarily leaders can, um, 
certainly help educate their populations. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, businesses that have large volumes of employees and um, that's the community. And so helping that those individuals understand the importance of their health and preventative screening and um, having a relationship with a physician that they see on a regular basis, not just when they're sick and recognizing symptoms that, um, that might be, uh, that might coincide with things like high blood pressure or diabetes um, can keep people in a better state of health. And not only will that prevent uh, be, be more likely to prevent them than uh, being infected with a virus like COVID-19, but it'll also uh, then be, make it more likely, make it more unlikely that they would uh, find themselves on a kidney transplant list or on an organ transplant list as well. And so um, both of those things are, are important. So, so thank you for that, Dory. Gary, I know you represent hospitals as a whole, um, and hospitals have great partnerships. Um, so what would you say business leaders can do uh, to help curb the lead when it comes to um, health disparities? Sure. Uh, Dory actually used the, the two words that I would be using also, education and knowledge. And it becomes very important because there's a lot of misconceptions relative to COVID, relative to healthcare, relative to even disparities. But the reality is, once again, at the end of the day, disparity exists. And so we, we, we need to make sure that within the, the workplaces that we, we recognize the, the population of our, of our own um, staff, our own employees, but also those that they serve. And recognizing that, um, that there, there may be some that have food insecurities, as an example. I, I did mention transportation as an example, but access becomes one of the biggies. And within MHA, one of the things that we have been able to do, for instance, is we, we created a health equity guide. And this has been a very successful uh, uh, publication document that we have shared extensively and continue to, to, to make available. But again, it, pro it provides those, those keywords knowledge and education and and the third word that i add to that is awareness and need to be for businesses they need to be aware of those that work with them for them and for those that they serve gary you mentioned a guide that sounds like it would be helpful um, to know a little bit more information how can our viewers access that guide well we, we, we we can, we can we can contact you can contact MHA. I'm sorry, I heard a little bit of some echoing there. Um, you can, we can contact MHA. Uh, MHA uh, uh, is available on, uh, on the uh, uh, on the website mha.org, and uh, uh, information is available there. Okay. So my next question um, to the both of you. We know that you know this event is to also bring awareness to Gift of Life's mission. So what are some specific things business leaders can do to support the mission of health and organ and tissue donation? And Dory, I'll start with you. Well, again, as I mentioned before, um, reaching their employees would be a tremendous help. Um, you know, oftentimes people get their health information through their employer. Um, they find out about uh, screenings or availability. And, um, and so business leaders could uh, write a letter to their employees um, sharing the importance of organ and tissue donation. Um, they could also root out recipients and donor families that work within their companies, which I I can almost certainly say there's someone in there who's been somehow impacted by organ and tissue donation or transplantation and, and ask them to share their personal stories, you know, like we heard earlier with Sandy. And, um, and I think that really brings it home to people. You know, oftentimes in healthcare, uh, we as Americans like to just put our blinders on and pretend that certain things aren't going to happen to us. But when they hear stories about um, you know, the woman that works in the next um, area than, than I do within the building 
um, experienced uh, organ donation firsthand or experienced organ transplantation firsthand, it means something more to them. And oftentimes it makes them more likely to take action and sign up in the donor registry. And so that's a, a great way that businesses could uh, further the mission and make uh, people more aware about organ and tissue donation. You know, Gary, before you um, start with this question, Dory, you raised a great point about stories. Stories are just so important. And I think Gift of Life's Facebook pages, um, your social media, you guys do a great job at highlighting those important stories. And, you know, I would love for you to touch on the Let's Talk Tuesdays, because that's another way where you guys bring those important stories to the forefront. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the, the Let's Talk campaign has been a tremendous success and something that we're really proud of at Gift of Life Michigan. And, you know, we started it actually in um, a very finite way that we were just going to do a certain number of them. And then the pandemic came and suddenly all of our accesses to our public uh, were cut off and we continued to do these Let Talk, Let's Talk Tuesdays. But the truth is people have questions about organ and tissue donation and, um, and they have difficulty getting to good sources to answer those questions. And so we have made ourselves available. We've provided a, a variety of information about the different parts of organ and tissue donation and the process, um, a deeper conversation than we could do in just a, a brief public service announcement or a brief news story that happens. Um, but we've also shared, as you mentioned, a lot of stories, a lot of personal stories. And, you know, I could talk all day about the importance of organ and tissue donation, but when you hear some of these individuals whose lives have been so dramatically impacted, um, whether it was a death of, of their child or their spouse and what it meant to them to give the gift of life, um, nothing beats that really nothing. And so uh, so we've been very proud of that project and our continuation of it. And for the foreseeable future, we're going to continue doing it. Wonderful. So, so Gary, from your vantage point, what would you say leaders um, need to do uh, to embrace Gift of Life's mission? Well, I, I, I'm going to preface that with, uh, uh, you know, with, with pointing out something that makes mo most people very uncomfortable, as it should. For somebody to be an old or organ donor or to receive, excuse me, for somebody to receive a, an organ or transplant, somebody else had to die. And it's, it's very sobering when you, when you have to look at it that way. And it's unfortunate. But stories also help to... Uh, uh, to point out that when somebody does pass and they become an organ donor, they, they can affect one person, they can affect two, they can affect many patients and make their quality of life better. It's very important to understand that although we may be talking about, for instance, a heart transplant, and we think of that as, as a, a life and death situation, we also look at the example of a, of a kidney transplant, where most certainly that it can affect somebody's uh, longevity, but even more importantly, it affects somebody's quality of life. The fact that they're not going to a dialysis center three or four or five times a week. The fact that they're that they have added freedom back to that sometimes they don't even remember the last time they they had that opportunity. So stories humanizing the. Uh, uh, what what uh, organ donation is about. And, and it's not always, as I said, it's not always the heart, it's not always the kidneys, it's not always the lungs. It's other tissues, including from, from and it, to help somebody's eyesight, tissues that are used to help somebody with, with fractures that will not otherwise heal, or wounds on their, their skin that otherwise would not heal. That's all part of the gift that comes from the gift of life. Now, one of the things that MHA has participated in now this is, is that uh, an annual competition among our hospitals to see who can register the most new organ donors. Once again, it, it reinforces the fact that at the end of the day, what organ donation means on both sides of that coin, uh, but it's also a, a little bit of a fun way to, to create some friendly competition among those that work together 
to uh, in increase the number of uh, uh, organs that are that are organ donor donors that are available throughout the state. Excellent. Excellent. I like that. Little friendly competition is always a good thing. So my next question, um, we have learned a lot about COVID-19 since it became a major health concern. We have also learned a lot about the healthcare system and how they're handling such a huge crisis. So what do you think are some lessons here um, as we continue to, to navigate through this pandemic? Who wants to start? Well, yeah. I was to say, at the, at the end of the day, our, our healthcare systems, they have to be a business. And I say a business is because they, they need to be, they have many employees, they, they buy supplies, uh, they take care of customers, they take care of patients. And so healthcare organizations um, may, may have their, their own foot, uh, uh, footprint in a certain area of, of the state. And sometimes there's even some competitiveness of, among healthcare systems. But one of the, one of the real uh, uh, strong outcomes that we saw associated with COVID was the increase in collaboration among healthcare systems. At the end of the day, healthcare systems always collaborated in taking care of patients, never a question. But COVID-19 has even, has even increased that collaboration. I use the, I use the example that we, we learned that the importance of getting the medical healthcare leaders together on a very regular basis to have conversations to help each other. Uh, so those, that is a key is, is collaboration. But another area is we, we also learn about the, uh, the, the fragile nature of our uh, um, supply chain. And the COVID-19 really pointed that out. And the best example is everybody's familiar with is PPE, personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, gowns, things of, of that nature where we found our hospitals were running out of these supplies uh, very, very quickly to where they may have had less than a day worth of these supplies available. Um, we have learned now the importance of, of having PPE uh, stockpiles available, not only within our regions, but within our hospitals. The vast majority of our hospitals throughout the state now have a good 90 day supply of PPE. Now, once again, that supply can be very fragile considering the increased numbers of COVID cases that we're seeing throughout our state, throughout, our, throughout the nation. But supply chain was a, was a very big uh, uh, lesson learned. We also learned about st various staffing models, how to staff the nurses, physicians, technicians, uh, those that uh, uh, clean the rooms and sanitize the rooms, those that uh, provide food within the hospital, how we needed to be more uh, uh, limber in, uh, uh, in staffing and how to best care for those that are caring for those that uh, are, are in the hospital. Testing, that was another issue is initially when COVID came about, we, we, did, we didn't even know how to initially test for it. We learned how to test for it. We learned how to uh, improve our testing abilities. And then of course, we identified the weakness of uh, resources to do the test. So we might've had the machines, but we may not have had the swabs um, as an example. So we've also learned how to optimize the, the testing. I mentioned staffing already. We've learned how to move staff within the state, even within the country. Traveling nurses were a, a, another example of uh, um, uh, how we was able to staff hospitals that were in, in greater need in one area of the state or one area of the country than, than in others. And then there was another lesson learned. And that was how, especially frontline workers were affected by what they were, were seeing, what they were, the patients they were taking care of. Taking care of. And we also, so we, we had to learn how to assist our frontline workers. And we also had to learn how to assist those that were working in the background, because besides the physical stress that you can actually see, there was the emotional stress, the mental stress. And that's another area 
where healthcare systems have concentrated in, a, in, in helping their, their staff, their employees, and the Michigan Health and Hospital Association has also taken a lead in that area. Great, great. And you know, Gary, just to follow up um, on that question, we're also starting to see an uptick in COVID cases. And you know, with flu season here, and tying this back to how business leaders can support their workforce, what would be something that we can share with our business leaders to try and um, help this situation? Um, I definitely, I definitely don't want to be where we started, you know. But um, what can we do now, you know, to, to stop or, or curb um, more? of an increase in COVID cases? That's a great question. We're, we're very concerned about the effects of uh, uh, flu and COVID together. And flu, we have been just familiar with for, for years, and we've seen the effects of influenza. Uh, so we need to do things to curb the likelihood of, of uh, coming down with flu or the influenza. Things that we already know, things that we have learned relative to COVID. But the one thing that we have with flu that we do not have yet with COVID is a vaccination. Vaccinations are, are available for, for the flu. We know that they are effective in reducing the likelihood of somebody coming down with the flu. So one of the number one things I suggest for, for businesses is to make it convenient for their for employees, staff, associates to get a flu vaccine, uh, reinforce the importance of a flu vaccine, and uh, to, to, to help with that. Within our own business, we, we partnered with a, pharma, with a pharmacy and uh, we made that available so that our employees could get their flu shot. Then there's the other things that we know about to re that will reduce the likelihood uh, of, uh, being, uh, of coming down with COVID, but also will reduce the likelihood of flu. Wash our hands, wear a mask, maintain distance. None of those things are, are, are new to us now. That is just that is part of that has become part of our culture. So the things that we have learned relative to COVID also applies to uh, the flu. And uh, that includes that if you're not feeling well, you shouldn't be you, you shouldn't be going to work. You shouldn't be around those that uh, uh, you could spread the flu to, or of course that you could spread COVID to. And uh, if, you, if, if you know that somebody is, as an example, as an employer, that you know somebody is under the weather, you should reinforce the importance that they not be in a position where they could be uh, uh, spreading the flu or COVID. Excellent. Dory, in terms of that question and from a gift of life perspective, um, do you have anything to add as it relates to helping business leaders sort of try and curb the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I, I appreciate all that, Gary. Oops, I hear a bunch of feedback. I appreciate all that Gary um, had to share. And, uh, you know, I the one thing I wanted to say uh, first is uh, in regards to our healthcare system and, and the things that we've learned about COVID-19. And um, while healthcare is a business and it's a system, it's built by individuals. And I think one of the things that we witnessed, especially in the early uh, days of, of the impact here in Michigan, is while many people were retreating to their homes and the safety of isolation, uh, we saw nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, everyone who worked in the hospital uh, charging towards the fire. And um, it, it makes me incredibly proud to see that, um, you know, at the end of the day, they rolled up their sleeves and put their own lives at risk in many instances to take care of others. And that's what the healthcare system is all about. And, um, and as Gary pointed out, it, then it, it translates then to the importance of us taking care of them as business uh, leaders. And, um, and I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, here at Gift of Life Michigan, we provide flu shots to individuals in the office. A group of our nurses administer those. We want to make it as easy as possible 
for people to get their flu shots. And certainly we're uh, standing by and waiting for a COVID-19 vaccine. And we will make that available to our employees as soon as it's available. Um, but the health and wellness of our employees, uh, I think, is, a, is paramount. And uh, we can't take care of others if we can't take care of ourselves. And, um, and I think business leaders can reinforce that. Um, it saddens me uh, deeply how, how politicized and how angry and uh, something so simple as wearing a mask um, has been made to be. And, um, you know, as an individual, I care enough about the people who I interface with that I'll wear a mask and I'd like for them to do the same. And I think a business leaders setting that tone in their organizations that, um, you know, we're, we're going to wear masks here because we care about each other. And, um, and when our customers refuse to wear masks, we're going to support our employees and ask them to do their business elsewhere. Um, and I, I think that's it's critical. Um, our employees need our support more now than ever. Yeah, Dory, you raised some great, great points. Thank you for that. So, you know, the pandemic has also brought more attention to health disparities minorities face, whether it's a lack of coverage, distrust in the system, or simply the fact that it seems disproportionately or seems to disproportionately affect people of color. Do you think that's the case? And that question is for the, the both of you. So Gary, if you want to give that some thought. Well, you, you ask it if it's the case, and I have to respond with it's the case because that's what we've seen. And we, we feel that we, we have some understanding on why there is that disproportionality, but then there are other things that we don't necessarily recognize. And one of it is we have our own biases. And I don't necessarily mean prejudices versus we have biases that we can recognize and we have biases that we don't know that we, that we have. And it could be something along the line of not recognizing an individual's risk for a, what we call a comorbidity, meaning something that makes them more at risk, such as not recognizing the risk for diabetes, not rest recognizing the risk for high blood pressure. And so we, we do know that some of these have some, uh, I'll use the word racial propensities, meaning that uh, uh, certain certain races may be at a greater risk for hypertension or, or diabetes, but also the circumstances such as the, the availability of, of healthy food choices, that most certainly can, can make, make a difference. Um, as far as how we're able to live, whether we, we live in a, uh, a building where there's many families, so there's increased exposure versus whether we, we live in, a, in a, a, a single family home. So those may be areas where there are determinants of, of, of health in itself. So, you know, as, as, a, as a healthcare community, we have been much more cognizant recognizing that, that there are disparities of, with our patients and uh, areas that we may not have concentrated as much on as the pan, in the past that we are now as we, as we continue to, to work with our patients. Uh, I, I will use another example, whether somebody is on a, a certain medication uh, that requires refrigeration and whether they have the ability to refrigerate a medication. These are things that we've become increasingly sensitive to uh, with, with the, uh, in the presence of, uh, uh, of COVID. Thank you, Gary. Dory, did you have anything to add to that question? No, I think, I think those are all good points. And I think that um, sadly in our, in this day and age, those are still realities that many families face. Um, Gary mentioned good nutrition. I, I was stunned to learn um, about the dependence on the school system to provide good nutrition to the majority of children in the United States. Um, you know, I think most of us, it's hard to fathom that um, that hunger is still a major, major issue here. But the truth is, I think, again, the pandemic revealed some of those weaknesses in our society that, that children depend on healthy meals at school. I think schools have 
really risen to the occasion and created ways to continue to get that food to the communities. Um, but it's, it's um, you know, our, our system is really interdependent on all these things. And when uh, there's an interruption into that, that uh, service, it's been incredible to watch many pieces fall and, um, and really shine a light on um, the things that we could really do better as a society. Excellent. Well, thank you both. Um, our time is actually up. This was a dynamic conversation and I know you both are busy and I appreciate your time today. And um, on behalf of Gift of Life Michigan, a special thanks um, goes to the two of you for this informative discussion. And I hope all of you joining us today continue this important dialogue that will help improve the quality of life for all. And Dory, I would like to end um, with you if you have any special words to share with our viewing audience. Well, obviously we want to encourage people to sign up to be organ and tissue donors. And um, you know, we know that the majority of people want to help someone else. And uh, now more than ever, uh, it's time to take action. And so uh, we'd encourage people to go to our website at giftoflifemichigan.org and make that commitment, to putting your name in the registry and have a conversation with your family that should something happen to you, uh, you want to be a donor. Absolutely. Thank you, Dory. Gary, did you have anything else to add? Any parting words? Well, just, just reinforcing what uh, Dory had just, had just said, uh, that in, in the, the, the toughest times in anybody's uh, life uh, can be turned around and make a big difference in, in, in others by providing the gift of life. And then the last comment that I will make, which is much broader, is uh, uh, wash your hands, wear your mask, <laughs> and keep your distance. <laughs> yes, and to that note, everyone be safe, and I appreciate you all for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.